This month for the Memphis Python user group, we're going to talk about serverless computing using uh, GitHub code spaces and Azure. And this is mainly going to be a discussion of Azure functions. And so in this video, I'm going to show you the basics of getting started with Azure functions inside of GitHub code spaces, and then I'll expand on this uh, later on. So first thing I'm going to do is instead of starting from a blank template, and this will come in uh, later, handy later on. I'm instead going to start from a repository. So I'm going to create a repository here. I'm going to call it uh, mempy yt for YouTube. I'll keep it private for now. And I want to put a readme file in it so that they'll go ahead and have some content. And now I'm going to create a code space from this repository. So I'll go to the code button and I'll create a code space from this branch. As we saw last time, this only takes a few seconds. Now, while we're waiting, I'm going to have to, in order to develop Azure Functions, uh, we're going to need to install the Azure Functions core tools. And the instructions for doing this are up on learn.microsoft.com. So I'm just going to copy and paste the commands and run them until that I do want to allow pasting. These first three are just going to set up the package list, the Linux packages rather, not the Python packages. And then we will be able to update that list. And then finally, with the list of packages updated, be able to install the Azure Functions Core Tools 4 package. All right, with that done, I'm going to create a new directory, call it mempy functions yt, and then I'm going to open that directory or folder inside of Codespaces. Now I'm going to create a new Python virtual environment because functions like to work inside of a virtual environment. And now I need to install the Python extension, like we saw last time. And now I'll use the Python extension to associate the virtual environment with this folder. Okay, now when I open a new terminal, It'll activate that virtual environment for me. All right. Um, they, the tools that we just installed, uh, there's a command called func, which is the command line interface for creating and managing Azure functions. And I'm going to create a, what's called a function app, just like with the web app or the app service that we saw in the in last month. You have to have an app plan, and then you create the functions inside of that app plan. So I'll say function init, and it's going to ask me what runtime I want to use, four for Python, and then it's going to write a bunch of files over here. Now one thing I do want to point out is it says it's found Python version 3.10, which is the which is what's installed on this um, WSL instance by default. Uh, currently, Azure Functions for Python does not support Python 3.11. You'll get an error if you try to use it. Uh, notice that there is a requirements.txt file in here, and so I'm just going to go ahead and run a pip install to get the package from there. And now I can create a new function inside of this app with func new. Now, functions have a trigger. In other words, it's an event that they respond to. And in this case, I'm going to select number nine, which is an HTTP trigger. So this is going to, this is going to be triggered by an HTTP event of some sort. And it's going to ask me for a name, and I'm going to use this to pull in cryptocurrency prices. So I'm going to call it investments. And it's going to create a file, call, a folder rather, called investments. And inside, it's going to be two files. First is going to be this init.py file, which is the code that implements the function. 
and then this function.json file, which determines what are called bindings. Now, bindings are determine how the function is triggered. It determines what data is used for input, what data is used for output. And here we can see that, like, like we defined, we have an HTTP trigger. This is going to be input, the direction. So this is coming in, um, and it's going to be a, an HTTP request, and it's going to respond to get and post methods. And then down here, uh, for output, it's going to be HTTP. So this is going to be an HTTP response, and that's going to be the, the output. All right, that's all we need to look at in there. So let's take a look at the uh, init.py file. And I'm going to disable the linter. So we don't see all those. It, the the linter is a little bit overactive, overzealous rather. So what this is doing is when we get a response, is when we get a request, to this function, it's going to execute main, and it's going to have the details of the request inside of it. First thing it's going to do is it's going to look for a parameter in the query string called main name. Name. If it doesn't find it, it will try to look inside of the body. So in other words, this would be for a get request, and this would be for a post request. If it doesn't find one, it's going to return this message here that says, "Hey, everything worked, but I didn't find I didn't find the name." Otherwise, it's going to return uh, a personalized response, like it says down here. All right. So let's see how this works. How can we run this locally? All I have to do is inside of the function app folder, func start. Now this is going to start a, a development server uh, on localhost 7071. And just like we saw last time, uh, Codespaces has determined that 7071 is being forwarded and I could open it up in the browser. Now, notice that there's more to the URL than just, the, than, than just this. So if I go over here to ports and I see 7071, I can copy the first part of the address and I'll open up a new tab and paste that. And then I need to get API investments. And now I should be able to paste that. It's going to connect to the port here. And then there we're going to get the message that comes up when we don't give it a name. So if I do give it a name in the query string, so name equals mempy. We'll get, the, we'll get the personalized response. So that works great. So how could we test the post? It's not that easy to do here in the browser, so I'm going to use an extension for Visual Studio Code or GitHub Code Spaces. And that is called RESTbook. Now, if you've ever used Jupyter Notebook before, I, you know how the concept of putting code in cells and executing the cells works, RESTbook does the same thing except with HTTP responses or requests. So what I'll do is I'll say uh, control shift P uh, RESTbook, create a new REST note blank notebook. I'll say I want to create a post request to again this URL and the content type, because we're going to pass JSON, is going to be, do, 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 yeah, content type is going to be application slash JSON. And then a blank line and then the JSON itself. And I'll run this. Notice that there's a 200 status code, which means nothing went wrong. There wasn't an error. However, what we got back is not what we expected. What we expect to get back is this. Instead, we got back a bunch of HTML. The reason why has to do with authentication. Codespaces does not know that RESTbook is supposed to be able to access this URL. If you remember, the first time uh, executing this URL, saw that screen that said connecting to the forwarded port. Where is it here? That's when it's authenticating or checking whether or not this request should be allowed. So what you're seeing here, what's being returned is the HTML for that page. 
Now, so how do we fix this? Well, it turns out that um, there is a, an environment variable inside of the code space called GitHub token. And this is a password. Treat it like a password. Uh, of course, I'll delete this code space when the video is published. But if I include this value in a header called x GitHub token, that's basically how we can authenticate these requests. So if I run it now, I'll get back hello posted. There's actually an even more convenient way to do this, and that's to have RESTbook store this as a secret. So if I say Control Shift P and RESTbook secrets, and tell it to add a new secret, call the secret GitHub token, and paste the value for the token in there. See down here, it says it saved the secret, and now I can eliminate this and say under, uh, dollar sign secrets dot github token. And if I run this, it's going to do the same thing. Now in the next video, I'm going to create a command line application for this, and we'll be able to see and see some more features that come in handy.